Hello! This episode is brought to you as part of Wanted Design Manhattan Online, a conversation series presented with Design Milk and Clever. Each day from May 11th to the 22nd, 2020, we'll feature design dialogues, including new episodes of Clever and engaging live conversations with very special guests. To view the schedule and register for events, head to wanteddesignnyc.com slash online. That's wanteddesignnyc.com slash online. Having those businesses without even really thinking uh, about it a great deal, just doing it with your friends and, and doing it part for fun, part for profit, really gave me the confidence to get on and use my creativity to forge my own path. Hi, everyone. I'm Amy Devers, and this is Clever. Today, I'm talking to famed British industrial designer, Tom Dixon. Tom Dixon grew up in England after spending his first four years in North Africa. He discovered guitar and ceramics in adolescence, and later, after dropping out of art school, he taught himself to weld and made a line of salvaged metal furniture that got him noticed. He worked with Capellini in the late 1980s to create his now iconic S-chair, And since 2002, he's been operating his eponymous design brand, designing furniture, lighting, accessories, and interiors. His work has been acquired by museums, Her Majesty the Queen has appointed him an Order of the British Empire, and even though he's firmly established on the international design scene, don't call him establishment. He gets testy about that. Here's Tom. My name is Tom Dixon, and I'm from London, England, and I'm a designer and an entrepreneur. I create things for a living, which is a great way to spend your life. (laughs) Yes, it is. And speaking of your life, let's talk about how it got started. I understand you were born in Tunisia and then grew up in England. So what can you tell me about your formative years? And, you know, what kind of kid was young Tom? What kind of things captured your imagination? Well, I spent four years in North Africa, in Tunisia, in Egypt, and in Morocco. Arrived in the north of England when I was four, which was a bit of a culture shock. I guess I was used to running around naked yeah. in, in the hot sun and then to come to damp and, and green England was, was really quite different. My mother is half French and half Latvian. My father's English. So I have a series of different cultures. But because we traveled so much when I was tiny, I guess it probably did have quite a lot of influence, certainly on things like food culture, sense of humor, cultural references, and I guess a lot of creatives have travelled a lot in their, in their infancy. Uh, but I came to London when I was five, and it's been my hometown ever since. And why for the transition from North Africa to England? My parents were just looking for work, you know. When you think about what kind of culture shock that was, how do you think that you know, manifested in terms of your worldview? I don't know, it's easy to post-rationalize, and, 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 um, mm-hmm. but I, I, I guess, you know, the Mediterranean, I guess, Arabic culture, the desert, you know, I remember many animals, you know, uh, locusts, mm-hmm. storms, camels, flying fish, you know, and, and um, mm-hmm. very, little, wow. very little else, the, the Suez Canal. Um, but, you know, I think the light and the difference in light um, struck me even at that age. We came to, to the UK in a very, very cold winter with snow drifts maybe five or six feet high. And that, that was a, mm-hmm. a real contrast in terms of climate. And how did your creativity start manifesting? What kinds of things were you interested in and how are you acting that out? I don't know. I was a, a very um, timid boy and I spent a lot of time in books until I was about 11 or 12. I went to a really very poor school academically, which I found mm. actually relatively easy because I'd done so many, so much reading. But what struck me there was the art department. It was a big school, a state school, and it had an amazing art department with life drawing, with metalwork, uh, technical drawing, woodwork, and ceramics. I think it was the ceramics department which really kind of taught me the transformational power of design on, on materials. You know, so clay is the archetypical ugly 
departure point, sort of very muddy and greasy material mm -hmm. with no shape, and then just <laughs> finding shape in that and and transforming it from a, a soft and wet material to to a hard functional material. I guess stayed with me. Did you have siblings, or were you um, kind of left to your own devices? And what kind of teenage years did you have? Were they rebellious or chaotic? I have a sister. She's an osteopath in New Zealand, so the other side of the world. Mm. And was I rebellious? Eventually, yeah. It took a little while to come out, but um, I was mm. always contrary. I didn't really want to do what other people were doing. I think um, I discovered guitars uh, at about 16, and then, you know, typically like most British kids of the time, probably American kids too, you were in a band. It was kind of what you did. So it was really through through that that I found a way of monetizing creativity, I guess, and, and also found a way of communicating. And, you know, I've, I've often observed that bands are, are really also entrepreneurial outfits. You know, you have to drive your own van, you have to make your own posters, you have to create your own tunes, you have to learn your own instrument. And and if you're any good, then you can start making money up. You know, bands are also really a hardcore collaboration on every aspect of the business and the creativity. But not only that, you're in vans traveling yeah. <laughs> around, frequently sleeping in the same hotel rooms or on people's couches. Have you been and, in a band? Um, Sounds like you've been in a band. <laughs> no, I've been close to band members, okay. though. <laughs> right. So I've, I've witnessed it. it. It made a giant impression on me what level of collaboration you have to be involved in in order to be in a band, in order to make it work. And I'm wondering how that influenced, how that stuck with you. Well, it definitely um, made me want to do something on my own. <laughs> I mean, there's, there's <laughs> a little no, too close there's nothing worse than being really stuck for that amount of time with with people that are that hormonal at that age and that smelly i i ended up doing all the driving yes. which really wasn't fair but you know I, th I think that you know there's always multiple egos and after a, a while that i sort of hungered for solitude and, and, and doing something on my own but you're right. Uh, d design is also collaborative. You know, particularly when you're you're getting things made and and selling them. There's there's also there's a, there's a big collaborative element in that. So I've grown to love it again, but more at a distance, less in less in the transit. Then. Yeah, it's a little bit more procedural, so you can collaborate in stages. The band, it's sort of all in. I <laughs> but there was a chapter of your life that included um, becoming kind of a successful. London-based band and touring and opening up for some major acts and a brief chapter of art school before dropping out. Can you can you tell me about this stage of your life? Because it sounds kind of turbulent, pivotal, and ultimately very expansive. Yeah, it probably was turbulent. But I, 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 immediately after high school, I, I went um, and tried art college, which really didn't agree mm -hmm. with me. And that was mainly because I guess the earlier experience when I was younger was was all that I needed to, to try and, and dabble a, a variety of different disciplines, you know. And Oh, yeah. So you already had that experience. Art college probably wasn't that novel. So it was, no, it was disappointing, really. I'd, I'd yeah. imagine that I'd find lots and lots of people like me and, and I didn't really. So, you know, so that lasted maybe six months. I drove into a car on a motorcycle and broke my leg and I never went back. So I spent three months in unable really to move. And after that, I, I just went and got a variety of, of jobs. I was a printer and I was a, a, a colorist or, or colored in cartoons and I was still mm. colored by hand. Um, and it was that time that we took off as a band and yeah, we, we signed, signed a record deal. We were a hot thing in, in London for about six months before we got signed up. And that, that was the, the, the fun time. We had our own destiny and, and played to our own crowd. And, and it was as soon as we signed to a big megalithic corporation that we ended up as support bands for, yeah. So we came to, to America. First time my first encounter was America was with Clash on Broadway. Mm. Uh, and the Clash wow. had been extremely generous in bringing over uh, different acts every night. Um, to support them from London. But that was an unpleasant experience because we were 
slightly disco and they were very punk and, and the crowd was expecting punk music so they didn't like that so there's a variety of, oh. of all the bands were jazz or reggae or disco and then the clash supporters really really didn't warm to any of the support acts so it was a disaster but uh, it took us really to record at electric ladyland which is Jimi hendrix's studio record a first single and then get back but you know so we I, I did that for a couple of years but then i had another motorcycle accident and broke my arm that was the end of my bass playing career. At that point, were you sort of planning to be a musician for your career? No, I, I, honestly, I, I'm, I'm always um, in awe of people that have got a plan. Uh, and, mm. and there's many people that have planned their careers and their lives and, and have studied to be what they are. But I had no plan and, and I just went whichever way the wind blew. And I knew I wanted to work. And so we we'd, we'd, um, picked up a a bit of the club culture that was going on in New York at the time. We brought it back to London um, and set up a couple of nightclubs, which were sometimes legal, sometimes illegal, and and, um, mm-hmm. and brought back uh, this idea of entertaining people in the clubs. And, and the clubs had stages, and, and I, I really taught myself to weld, really, as a kind of way of making stage sets and performance in, in these clubs. And the, the club world is a very good way of getting to know a lot of people superficially. A lot of those people end up being hairdressers, fashion designers, photographers, people that need stuff. You know, So when they knew right. I made stuff, I became the metal worker. It's, it's a very scrappy, creative, resourceful, DIY in the punk sense kind of tribe. The, the club scene, the band scene. And it's very entrepreneurial in that people are sort of not following any sort of prescription and they're just taking the resources they have at hand and making it making it into something. And it sounds like that suited you quite well. Well, it still does, really. I mean, I, I'd, I'd, I'd rather make up my own rules and really having those businesses without even really thinking uh, about it a great deal, just doing it with your friends and, and doing it part for fun, part for profit, um, really um, gave me the confidence to just get on and use my creativity to forge my own path. So that is really uh, what I continued doing for quite a while. You're teaching yourself to weld as a way to build stage sets and entertain. At what point did it sort of morph into building, welding a collection of of furniture that got you some attention and put you on the map as a designer. Well, so, so welding is a, an amazing technique because it allows you to build things really quickly and, and with no no fear. And I think, you know, if you're a woodworker, you, you tend to have to be more measured, more precise. You have to wait for things to happen, like gluing. You have to cut joints. Um, you know, welding allows you to just put things together and those things can be very strong and dynamic. And, and if it doesn't work, you can cut it apart and start again. You know, as well, the, the, the streets of London were a place where you could find a lot of metal, actually. There was a lot of things being, a lot of houses being converted at the time and, you know, metal work being chucked out. It was free. And so I, I think the, the only thing that I had wasn't really skill. You know, I can't call myself a, a craftsman. It was much more just persistence and practice you know i think all too often people don't get enough practice at at making things you know that was the beauty of the metal it's like if it didn't work you could reuse it but i was very productive and i made a lot of things and i made them for fun and then people started buying them and i just thought well this is extraordinary this is like being a baker or something you can make something and sell it the same day um and there was a a freedom to that existence and and autonomy how would you describe the transition i don't even know if it's a transition it's an evolution into a full-blown designer working with capolini how did that come about and how were you feeling as you were growing into an established international designer? Well, I still don't feel like an established international <laughs> designer. Well, that's refreshing. I mean, I, I don't um, even know what that feels like, but I assume <laughs> after yeah, this be, long of a career, please, you might please. might have accepted it about yourself. Yeah, don't call me establishment. That's an insult. So London was recognized as a place that people came to see creativity. There's a strong tribal scene of 
goths and still remnants of punks and skinheads, new romantics. And the music scene was, was still really strong. And the club scene was strong. And people came for alternative culture. And mm-hmm. At the time, you know, I really wasn't selling a great deal to English people or British people. I was selling more to um, people that were based in London, people that were, you know, Italians in finance or Japanese people coming over for for, for the week or, or, or Germans that were coming to show something new in their art galleries. There was no real domestic market. You know, okay. London and the UK was, was still in a pretty steep recession at the time. So I had an international audience and the Italians came knocking at the studio door. Capellini was one of the first to break with um, the tradition of, of mainly using Italian studios to do the creative direction of their brands. And he'd been looking for new ideas. And, you know, London w- was known, you know, for alternative culture, mainly in fashion, I think, rather than furnishings. Uh, he came to my studio, but I think probably I, I met him in Milan before that. Um, I'd been asked to do a, a, an, an exhibition with oh, Mark okay. Newson and what became Corso Como 10. I don't know if you know that shot. That's making sense, how all the dots connected. And he selected that chair, which I'd probably tried a half a dozen ways of, of making as something that could sit in his collection. So I licensed it to him. That gave me a kind of access to the Milan Furniture Fair, gave me access to an international reputation, I guess. And, and it was a very innovative company at the time, which people were very interested in. So that, that, that's still in production with Capellini now, all of those years later. Well, I just spoke to Giulio Capellini, and he related his talent for spotting long sellers, not best sellers. I think it speaks volumes that that chair is still in production. Is that the first piece that you achieved a certain scale with from hand welding salvage furniture to going into production with the S chair? Were there a lot of pieces in between? Yeah, I mean, we're we're talking probably seven or eight years in. I mean, I, I had gone from making things myself, sometimes, you know, on stage, on my own, but to having a, a, a metal workshop with 10 or 15 people, making things, you know, in batches, working to commission or doing exhibitions. And, and so it, it, was, it wasn't a one-man show. And we, we produced, I probably produced 100 um, of those chairs in a very different form, covered with, with rush basket work. Sometimes mm-hmm. inner tubes of tires before before Capellini saw it and made it in, in, in the way it's made now. You're now, let's say, thirty plus years into being a designer of furniture, interiors, objects, accessories. How would you characterize your overall evolution, uh, both creatively and musically? I mean, all of it. Like, how would you describe? <laughs> You know, I had a lot of other stages as well, which included also spending 10 years as creative director for a company called Habitat, which never really existed in in the US, apart from one store. But it was owned by IKEA at the time. So I'd um, jumped from being a self-making designer to working for one of the biggest, in fact, the biggest furniture company in the world. And so I spent 10 years there before I started my own label again. So what, what's atypical about me is that I've had a, a broader series of experiences from, you know, self-making to working in corporations to doing my own label to working with the Italians. So there's just a, a, a broader sweep of, of experiences there, which are also very different market levels as well. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm, I'm interested in all of them still. I'm interested in making things cheap and making things expensive. I'm interested in industry and I'm interested in craft. And that, and then I'm also interested in things which aren't designed. I'm still interested in music, but I'm particularly interested in food right now with you know, a couple of restaurants that, 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 that we have. And, and, and that strikes me also as you know, something which has a degree of similarity to some of the entrepreneurial things that we were doing um, before. So, you know, restaurant also has this thing of making something, you know, like producing something, which I really like. Mm-hmm. It's also got the, the kind of creativity that you get in, in the music businesses. You know, I'm, I'm hoping I'm hoping that I have uh, more and more unexpected adventures in 
uh, not just design, but also you know other fields as well, where I bring the experience of design into that next field as well. What I'm hearing from you are a couple of things. Between music, welding, and food, there's an immediacy to the, the creation that sounds like it appeals to you. There's also, um, you've set up your brand so that you can also still experiment. That's sometimes economically hard to do, but you're making it work. It sounds like it's it's probably a, a, a crucial part of keeping the joy alive is your ability to experiment and follow your curiosity. Yeah, I mean, that's half the point of doing it is to be able to surprise yourself again. I mean, I can't imagine what it must be like to go into the same job doing the same thing every day. So I've purposely set up my infrastructure to, to allow me to have a series of different and sometimes conflicting events going on. I mean, often I'm working much less as a designer and either more as a you know marketeer or a product developer or an engineer um, and all of the things that surround design as well. And, and sometimes I even think that design is a, a bit of an odd word because, you know, it's, it's a relatively recent invention, you know, where it was called before, I don't know, decorative arts or something. You know, it wasn't seen as, a, as, as the thing that it is now. And it's, it's also become such a baggy word which encompasses so many different types of activity which could range from styling to software design mm. so I, f- I find it very imprecise as a word to describe you know the, the multitude of different things you have to do to not only think up new ideas and but also put them into production and then find a way of communicating them and and wow. making people interested in enough for them to part with their hard-earned cash you know so we do that and, and lots of things around it and and try and keep the whole thing alive at a time when it's increasingly difficult to be a, a smaller brand and it's it's even more difficult to to be in you know certainly in retail and, and some of those ways that you used to get things to market before have become harder and harder to do you talked about food which i think is really exciting and i want to get more into that but before we talk about food and some of your experiments that are ongoing you said that you like to surprise yourself and mm-hmm. I think one of the common pitfalls, or certainly some of the some of the things I've heard from other people, is that there's a point at which, when you're scaling your business, at which you can kind of fall into a trap where you become more of a, a manager than a designer. So the fact that you've set yourself up, your business up, so that you can still surprise yourself and experiment is maybe not as obvious as you might think, for some other people. So is there anything you can share about some of the challenges in terms of creating that space for yourself? Yeah, it's difficult. I mean, I think you're probably better off, you know, from a consistency and a financial perspective, not challenging yourself constantly. I think people appreciate almost too much consistency. But, you know, for, for just for creativity alone you have to constantly put yourself into i'd say uncomfortable situations and 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 try and push yourself to try things that you're not familiar with and i think it's good to be expert when Mm -hmm. people come to you for your expertise Um, but at the same time you have to find a way of, of injecting freshness into 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 your core capabilities, otherwise it will go stale very quickly. Having said that, you know, the modern world demands you to be fresh and new uh, almost every day now. Mm -hmm. And and so that's also something which actually suits me quite well because I I prefer doing new ideas and finishing off old ones, you know. But um, what we've managed to do is, is to have, you know, a few successful globally products that allow us to um, experiment around the edges and then also try and rethink always what you know what what a designer can be if they want to self-produce and try and Mm -hmm. think of a a, an original way of, of getting things to market is there a piece or a project that really stretched you 
in terms of your personal growth or really surprised you, you surprised yourself with? I try and push slightly the limits of, of what we do. So, I mean, the, the one that, that, that interests me at the moment is the one we were talking about just a second ago, which is kind of the restaurant. Mm-hmm. So really that's it's partly actually because I, I, I took a studio which had a commercial kitchen inside it and it seemed a shame to pull it out and throw it away. Uh, but it was also partly because I thought once that opportunity was presented to me that it would be a much more clever and interesting way to have a furniture showroom than having a furniture showroom because you know furniture showrooms are in essence relatively static and, yeah. and you know in in the way that people buy furniture which is uh, particularly large pieces once every 20 years or maybe even once a lifetime it's really not a, a particularly attractive retail proposition particularly in the in the world which which demands and requires you know freshness and newness all the time so you know the, the way you have a, a furniture or justify a furniture showroom in a city center might be having a restaurant so it's a complicated business i can't really recommend it for anybody else but a series of circumstances put me in a position where i could do that and rather than saying well no that's not my core business or restaurants are the riskiest proposition of any business you could get involved with it just seemed to fit because we had the furniture we had the kitchen and we needed to bring in more people and i wanted to give life to a space and so food does that and it does that and recreates itself um every day or twice or three times a day if you do breakfast yeah. as well you know and, and it gets a lot of people through the door if you can have a successful restaurant um, but of course we do the base of a restaurant which is what it looks like and what it you know the, the comfort that you sit in and the table that you 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 sit at and the, you know the glasses that you drink from and the light that illuminates the place are all the things that we do and it's worked really well in terms of trying to demonstrate not just a design style but how you live with the stuff well, that's what I was going to say is a furniture showroom is really just hypothetical. Like here's the piece and you can try and imagine what it would be like to live with this. But it's sort of unapproachable in that you're not supposed to enjoy it. But in a restaurant setting, you really can. Like not only is the piece something that you're trying out interactively, but you're actually making memories and breaking bread and bonding and forming a relationship with the pieces, even if it's short term. But I think that right there is essentially what a long term commitment with piece of furniture is about. So there's a distinct uh, materiality to your work that I presume comes from a, an intimacy with materials. And I wonder if if that's changed for you over the years? I mean, I I'm, I'm don't know if you're still welding as much as you used to. Yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, like I've said earlier, I get bored very easily, but, but you know, I also get obsessed with, with a specific material or often a, a manufacturing or craft technique, and, and I, I tend to explore it as deep as I can possibly go for a reasonable amount of time and then move on and, and then toy with it again later on. So, you know, we, we've, you know, the, the, the steel was, was definitely the thing that made me into designer, although ceramic, you know, mud, clay was the thing that, that pointed me in that direction. You know, at the moment it's glass. Um, I've got a lot of ideas for specifically pressed glass which is often used industry which i'm trying to do in, in different ways but i've had experiments with soft materials more recently with a lot of textiles which allowed me to get a lot more comfort and a lot more color into into what we we're doing mm-hmm. and you know my metallic um, tastes have evolved from steel to copper to brass and now really um, quite a lot of aluminium and stainless steel there's there's definitely a a thread running through there, which is the the materials are always the departure point. And again, I, mean, I quite like making the analogy with food, which is that you know you're, you know the, the chefs that I like are, are getting very good raw ingredients, and they're respecting them. They're trying not to mess with them too much. They're trying to get the best out of their um, their materials, and that's kind of what we do. Um, in the studio and of course we're more intimately connected to to materials because we also have to 
uh, unlike a lot of designers who haven't set up to do their own production or their own stock holding or their own retail is that we're you know we're, we're very close to the people that make the stuff so we know all of the manufacturers and you know they're, they're all over the world but we've been to all of the factories and we know um, the people that make our stuff well that's a nice connection are you cooking are you exploring food in that way Probably a bit more in the last restaurant than, than this one, which is actually really busy. So you, you have to make a, a proper heavyweight commitment to starting your shift at three, three in the afternoon, and then going all the way through to midnight. And um, so uh, I've become slightly lazy in, in, in professional cooking. I, I used to do a shift a week at, at the other restaurant, which is a bit lazier um, and, and more relaxed. But th- this one is in a more higher volume. Um, restaurant of course it's closed at the moment but we're hoping to reopen is this a time of experimentation for you or i mean in the kitchen or otherwise i know that you know we're we're in a space and time that will forever be marked by covid19 and i'm wondering how you're getting through this chapter what your primary tools and or qualities or traits are well i quite like chaos and it's a very chaotic time i mean i do worry though Mm -hmm. about the the company about the you know the the world that we'll emerge into but it's definitely a time to rethink what you're doing and to and to take advantage of a bit of um mind space although most of it taken up with phone conferences actually so that (laughs) seems to become the thing uh where i thought i'd actually be using my hands a lot more I've been stuck in front of a computer screen more than I've ever been before in my life. It's kind of shocking. I do think that there's, um, you know, that there's definitely going to be a, a readjustment, and it's, it's, you know, you put a lot of time and energy into into thinking what shape your company can be to um, to face up to a new, a new future, which is evolving and changing every day. So it's an it's a interesting time to to think about how you can survive, um, which is, you know, certainly sharpens the mind, that's for sure. And and how about you on a on a personal level? Like are you handling this with I guess more optimism because it's an opportunity and you thrive in chaos? Or are you sometimes consumed with your own fears and of survival for your family and well i mean it's not got to that yet and you know i think you don't want to over dramatize it but you know i I worry more about the the 200 people that are in my employ and and how we can possibly pay them when there's no you know there's no business being done no goods being moved nothing being made um so that's you know that's the thing that worries me I, you know I worry for the manufacturers I, I, I worry for the, the the dealers and distributors that we that we supply you know so I'm not taking it frivolously and um it, it requires some you know some pretty tough decisions just to just to keep believing that you can come out the other end so I think it's affecting everybody but at the same time, I think that there is also a degree of hysteria, which which um, you have to be careful not to, or, or, or not to, you know, to sink into deep depression right now. Is there a chapter of your life prior to this that you think maybe trained you? Well, I've, I've lived through you know, half a dozen crises that that looked like they were going to be never ending. There was a when I was a teenager. There was only power three days a week, and you weren't allowed to have baths that were more than three inches deep. And you know, and, and, and there was strikes all over the all over the world, and violence. And you know, I mean, I, I remember you know things that seemed more scary than this actually. So I don't doubt that there'll be a new beginning. What What are the simple pleasures that are bringing you peace right now? And it it sounds like you thrive in chaos. So maybe. Peace isn't something that ever leads you. <laughs> Nature is chaos, isn't it, as well? Yes, yes. Um, you've only got to watch an Attenborough documentary. Well, in fact, <laughs> I was watching Jane, the Jane Goodall documentary last night. So there is more television, definitely. But um, no, I mean, it's spring in, in, in London. It's, it's kind of, um, you're seeing rebirth all around you. And, and, you know, for sure, the stars are brighter because there's less pollution. The, the flowers are coming out. There's more birds. And you know, the insects still seem to be struggling. So there's not so many butterflies or anything. But it's an unusually warm and early spring. 
Mm-hmm. And um, although there's a lot of being stuck inside, I mean, you know, I'm fortunate to have some outdoor space and, and be close to, to a lot of greenery. Uh, you know, London is one third parks as well. So, you know, and, and we've seen people with much, much more severe lockdowns, you know, we, we, because we, we have some things made in, in China um, and we have some things made in Italy um, that they've had both both of those nations have had much more severe lockdowns than we have. And, and, um, and it was probably even scarier because there was no prehistory to it. So, you know, in a way, I'm fortunate and um, I, I see, you know, signs right now of a bit of light uh, at the end of the tunnel. I mean, you know, the infection rate today has, has, has dropped hugely in the UK. Mm-hmm. And they're already talking about the restrictions uh, loosening a bit. So I think it will do some good to some people um, to have had to take time off work. But it's going to be a disaster economically, that's for sure. Fast forwarding to f- further in the future, let's mm-hmm. say when this is in our rearview mirror, what's your most optimistic vision for your future? You've got to hope that people, that, that somehow other people... Um, get used to consuming a bit less and, and flying a bit less and, and realizing that there's a, you know, there's a link between this and, and the destruction of the natural world. It gives me a chance to reassess you know, what I do and, and what I make and, and who I make it for. And so I'll be looking at readjusting all of that. Churchill said, never waste a good crisis. <laughs> uh, I think that's solid advice. And we'll be staying tuned to see what creative genius comes out of this i wonder if if there is a current project that you want to share with our listeners that we can look forward to either in the pipeline or that's out right now that you want to call attention to you know we 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 do in the majority lighting is the biggest part of our business and lighting is a kind of you know really exciting field to work in and has been for a few years with you know the, the the whole industry being powered by amazing engineering and scientific innovation in transformers mm. and LEDs and all the rest of it. So mm-hmm. we've, we've been working recently with some good friends of us as in Innsbruck that have a, a professional lighting company, a track lighting mainly, which is very discreet and very minimal. Anyway, they make it all in, in the mountains of Innsbruck and they've managed to keep their factory open during the whole crisis and we're, uh, we're able to launch this series of, of very flat and, and very basic um, LED panels um, with them, which is something we've been doing over the last couple of days. So what's kind of nice is the, you know, where, where normally our, our, our lamps are made in reasonably big, big quantities and then sent all the way around the world. These are, are made to order, so they're, they're not made until somebody orders them and then they're delivered oh. five or six days later. So there's an efficiency about it. It, it, it plays into my interest in engineering. Um, it's using you know, some of my most recent thinking about circuit boards, which are really the things that power uh, the modern world, you know, and... and um, and, you know, I'm, I'm really keen to, to see if we can do a significantly different business model, but also a, a different way of, of lighting spaces technically. You know, we, we've been very decorative, if you like, and so it's kind of nice to work in a field which is now you know, much more about um, technical lighting and, you know, light output and how you illuminate um, spaces architecturally rather than, decoratively so that's that's my latest um wheeze and of course you know it's been really difficult this month because this month is normally um the milan furniture fair which is the big big event for us in 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 mm-hmm. europe in fact global event um, that i'm sure you've been to but we've been unable to launch anything of the normal things that we do so what was quite nice is having these other projects which should have been probably less visible and less less obvious um being the only things that we can we can launch right now because they they don't depend on these quite complicated global supply chains and distribution chains, which you know we've been part of for so long. So it's, it's trying to rethink what we make and, and, and who we sell it to, which is what I was talking about earlier. 
um, includes trying to make things in a more bespoke way and a, a more personal way, but in a very technical way as well. And, and what's astonishing is that that's not done, you know, in some remote um, location. It's done in, in the beautiful um, ski resorts uh, above <laughs> uh, Innsbruck. Yes. What's the name of this project? Uh, it's called Code, like Morse code. So it's, it's, it uses a, you know two or three very simple uh, modules, which um, themselves are, you know, you can you can adapt and, and, and specify in, in, in your own way. So so it's really about also only designing up to a point and then liberating a system to other designers to to then adapt to their own needs. A bit yeah. like a Meccano, a Meccano kit or a Lego kit. Yes, <laughs> lighting Legos. Well, this has been really interesting. Thank you for sharing your your whole trajectory and your personality with us. Well, thank you for having me. Thanks, everyone, for listening. To see images of Tom Dixon's work and read the show notes, click the link in the details of this episode on your podcast app. Or, even better... Go to cleverpodcast.com where you can also sign up for our newsletter. If you haven't already, please subscribe to Clever on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. And if you would, please do us a favor and rate and review. It really helps. It really helps. We love it when you reach out to us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. You can find us at Clever Podcast, and you can find me at Amy Devers. Clever is produced by 2VDE Media, with editing by Rich Straffolino and music by L1011. Clever is proudly distributed by Design Milk.